conference. Um, uh, thank you to, to the uh, um, planning committee and um, who put this together, including uh, time for the awards. And of course, thank you to everyone who nominated um, folks for all of the awards. Um, it was a, an absolutely incredible group of nominees, um, more than um, we can recognize at once. Um, anyone who has uh, put in a nomination and their candidate uh, wasn't included this year, please, 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 please nominate the person again. Um, there's so much good work happening across the Perio projects and throughout the community. Um, I wish we could nominate everyone, but if um, but obviously our uh, award recognize everyone with an award, but um, if you didn't get uh, someone on there this year, please uh, try again next year. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank uh, the board for taking the uh, Perio board for taking the time to review the candidates and um, and make their uh, selections. And so without any further ado, let me see if I can get the slides to work. Ah, there we go. So this year we've decided um, with the planning committee and uh, the uh, awards nomination uh, committee um, to recognize Ian Dolphin for his years and years of service to not only the Aperio Foundation, but also the um, open source community globally the higher ed and even more broadly education community. Um, as you all know, his, his experience with uh, mm -hmm. dates back to uh, Sakai and JSIG, who's the first director. Um, his nine years, 10 years of work. I mean, I, I would say even further because I, in my role, I'm emailing him once a week <laughs> to, to ask questions and gain insights and understand understand things um so the organization has seen tremendous growth and success and that's all because of the work that the community does so we thought what a better way to both recognize ian's contributions over the years uh but to rec um, recognize the contributions of those um in the community so it really paired up nicely um, so we're naming um, the Aperio Dolphin Awards uh, to, in oops, don't use that button, uh, to, in oh, and uh, just a quote from Ian, um, it's been an honor to work with so many talent members. I think this highlights that connection again. Um, Ian's work to uh, provide leadership and community and, and grow projects is reflected in the opportunities and the contributions made across the community. And so what a better, I can't think of a better fit. Um, and also to thank Ian uh, for his time and service to the community. So the awards were, uh, um, have always been the Aperio Fellows and the recognized service and contributions um, from all sorts of individuals across the uh, community. So whether they're in the projects or whether they um, uh, did technical development or instructional design or pedagogy or, um, recognizing the variety of, of people and encouraging continued work in all of the activities that support a Perio Foundation, um, the institutions and organizations involved. Uh, the teaching and learning, uh, recognize innovations, innovation in teaching and learning uh, using open source software. So um, those who have fully embraced open source software and often other open initiatives, open educational resources, uh, open content, open data, open research, and so on. Uh, Enterprise Solutions, this is a new award, and, and this was for folks that are uh, working in the technology, um, maybe in implementation to make services available, to provide a broader uh, or increased broader adoption of open source software, um, not only with the Perio projects and tools, but with the broader open source community, and even uh, dare we say, proprietary uh, options out there. So fostering open source development um, from a technical solution uh, side. And then um, the last award is the Innovator Advocate Networker or the Ian Award. And this is really to honor someone who, and recognize someone who's been a champion for a Perio, open source, ed tech, higher ed, someone who stepped forward to help lead not only the organization, but the adoption of um, open source software within higher education um, and a pair of tools. So without any more 
babbling by me. Hopefully that was a Creative Commons license drum roll, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, the, oh, what's your win? Sorry, a certificate of uh, recognition, um, a swag bag uh, with a related Aperi Award, and I guess now Dolphin stuff, um, a cash award of uh, $599, uh, $1 below the IRS uh, threshold. Uh, so you don't have to report as income in the U.S. And uh, we'll work with you depending on your uh, country that you are, are obligated to uh, for tax reporting uh, to make sure that you're not penalized for winning the award. Um, complimentary registration to the following year's Open Apparel Conference and up to $1,500 uh, total um, toward uh, apparel-related conferences and events. So it doesn't have to be an apparel-related specifically, but if it's uh, something, I'm thinking of the media and learning group uh, with the open cast folks, um, something like that, something that's helping to um, increase awareness and adoption of an Aperio tool or uh, further its development. So I, I don't have the drum roll again, so we'll have to do it ourselves. Um, the Aperio fellows uh, this year, uh, Alan Reagan from uh, Pepperdine University, Carlos uh, Rivalta uh, from University that I'm, my Spanish is muy mal, so I will not even attempt it. Um, uh, Christopher Beach from Unicon and uh, Julianne Morgan from University of Dayton. Um, I forgot to Toro and I apologize, Miguel. Thank you for the correction there. So those are our Aperio fellows. Uh, we'll be in contact with you um, to uh, uh, somehow, since we're not in person, transfer the awesome swag bag and certificate of recognition and so on. Um, so we'll follow up soon. Um, next up, the award for teaching and learning, um, Tobias Thielen. And there's the nomination. I thought it uh, was uh, so excellent description of the work that Tobias has done um, that uh, it's included there. And again, um, I'm not sure if Tobias is on, but uh, uh, thank you for the years and years of, uh, of contributions and commitment um, to open source and the open source community and Aperio, and of course, the implementation and teaching and learning. Um, at the end of the day, like the Aperio website says, um, Aperio is serving the academic mission. And to see the work, and I was blown away by looking at the nomination form, but to see the work all of those who are doing it hands-on in the classroom, uh, educating students, um, and to see the creativity, the innovation is inspiring. And um, to add to that, uh, taking the time to contribute back um, is, is back to the projects. It's an incredible, uh, contribution and donation, really. So thank you, Tobias, for your time um, uh, and uh, your commitment to, to uh, not only a pair, but to teaching and learning, um, which is what this is at the end of the day all about. Thank you so much. Uh, the next is the Ian Award. And uh, Jim Helwick, um, who has been around, um, I have known Jim since early 2000 when I was at UCLA and we were looking at uPortal. Um, I met him then. Um, and uh, he has been on the Aperio board. He was on the JSIG board. Um, he's been involved in uPortal for a variety of roles. And I believe while his current institution, which shall be nameless, um, it may no longer be as involved with uPortal as we all might like, he still continues to uh, work with the uPortal community. Um, he also is still working with Aperio as a member of the Finance Committee. Um, and his historical knowledge and um, institutional knowledge um, has been invaluable for the organization, and especially to me um, coming in new in this interim role to understand um, the finance issues and um, you know just the finances and the issues that are are affecting Aperio today. So thank you, Jim, uh, for all of your work. I was looking for that 
cool uh, flash mob dance uh, video to put up here, but I couldn't find the licensing rights. And I was afraid we might be subject to a copyright infringement um, from, you know, you might pursue against us. So I didn't put it up there. Um, but that's it. Thank you so much uh, to all of our um, award recipients. Thank you, too, to those who nominated um, uh, folks for the awards. Um, again, um, uh, thank you, Ian, uh, for all the work you've done. And um, at that, I will hand it over to Jen, I guess. Uh, there we go. Um, I think at this point, honestly, it's time to hand it over to Josh Wilson, uh, VP and COO of Longsight, and the panel to discuss debunking the no support myth for open source software. So Josh and uh, we have Sharice Arrowwood from Unicon, Alan Reagan of Pepperdine, Miguel Pellissier of Internal Stefamacion, and Wilma Hodges of both Longsight and Sakai and Perio. She wears a lot of hats. Um, we'll let you take it away. So uh, welcome everyone to our debunking the no support myth for open source software panel. Um, we do have our, our panel of uh, speakers today. So let me just do some really quick introductions. Um, we have Sharice Arrowwood from Unicon. Sharice is a senior director for Unicon. Her primary area of focus resides in the Identity and Access Management Program. She has over 25 years consulting experience, 17 years with Unicon, um, which have allowed for her depth of experience and working knowledge in many areas to hold and continue to expand the open source. Highlight areas include security and access, learning management, hosting, support, and array of services. Um, so she brings uh, participation in several um, conferences and organizations across uh, throughout the year. Um, we also have um, Miguel Pellissier. He's the Chief Technical Officer at EDF. He's been working with open source software for education for the past 14 years with more than 30 deployments and 200 projects all around the world um, in four continents related to LMSs, content authoring tools, web conferencing, LTI tools, plagiarism, learning analytics, and others. Um, he's a volunteer for Perio. He's a member of the Sakai PMC, and he also is the Internationalization and Security Chair for Sakai. We have Alan Regan from the Director of IT Client Services at uh, Pepperdine University, and he has over 20 years experience. Alan is passionate about helping the academic community use technology to meet teaching and learning needs. And he is also a champion of open source solutions for higher ed. And finally, um, we have Josh Wilson at Longsite. He's our, C our vice president and COO at Longsite. He leads client relations, business operations, product development, and strategic planning. He's been a leader in academic technology for more than a decade, serving mostly, most recently as associate CIO for academic technology at Brandeis University. Um, he established the Maker Lab at Brandeis, and he's uh, won multiple awards at the World Maker Fair. Um, he's served more than a decade on the management team for the MISO survey, which is a national survey. And um, he chairs our Sakai's marketing team. He's also on the roadmap uh, guru, and he's on the Sakai PNC committee as well. So um, that is our uh, illustrious group of panelists today. Um, so what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to be talking about a few of the myths that you may have heard. They're ones that come up often when um, people, particularly people who aren't particularly familiar with open source, may raise as questions or um, sort of urban myths that they've heard that may make them somewhat reluctant to try um, diving into the open source uh, arena when it comes to uh, software for their institution. So we're going to go through each of these and kind of debunk them, um, talk about why they aren't really the case. Uh, so the first myth that we're going to talk about is, um, oh, sorry, that was my introduction slide. Um, the first myth that we're going to talk about is open source software is free for universities and organizations to use. 
So, Alan, how would you respond to this? Well, um, this is going to be a horrible analogy, but, you know, like the air that I breathe, I don't necessarily pay for, but uh, in order to use it, I have to use my body, right? My muscles, my lungs, you know, my blood has to process it. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So even if I'm not, quote unquote, paying for the air that I breathe to use it, there are still resources that are necessary, right? So in open source, I'm not paying for the license, right, to, to, to get it. I can just download it, use it, et cetera. But I still need to be able to host it. I still need to be able to support it. Uh, I need to train people to use it. Um, if I want to make it better, you know, I need to either invest in internal resources or contract with others to develop and improve, um, et cetera. So it's not as if uh, open source software is 100% free, right? Um, that said, you know, Pepperdine previously was on a major commercial LMS platform. And then when we shifted over to the open source Sakai LMS platform, we saved over 70% uh, by making that change, right? So we reduced our costs by an extreme amount. Um, so there are a lot of potential uh, financial benefits to moving into this space. Um, so, and, and one, of course, of course, you're not paying for the license fee, right? This this privilege, so to speak, to use this uh, proprietary software. So that would be one of the things that I'd mention. I, of course, I would want to outline just everything that I mentioned too. You have to think about the other things you would you would have with any piece of software, from support, hosting, training, internal resources, and then it also includes the time for your folks. Um, you know, we we might not be quote unquote paying for a license. Um, but you know, you want to make it better. You want to put in those feature requests. You got to put in those bug reports. You know, you you put in the things that help to make it better. And if you do invest in making it better yourself by either taking your own resources and you know hiring developers or internally doing things, hopefully you're giving it back and everybody else benefits. And you have that virtuous cycle, that beneficial cycle, because you freely received a resource, at least by not having to pay for it to begin with, and you're giving back. So that's how I would respond to that. Great. Thanks, Alan. Um, do any of our other panelists have anything they'd like to add on that particular? So I, I just offer one other thought, uh, which is this, you know, so I think that you know, open source software may be a, a lower cost option for universities, you know, but even when open source software is uh, of equal cost to uh, to other, uh, you know, compared to other products, right? I mean, I think it's not that the product itself is of equal cost. It's there's institutions have this ability to be able to direct their their costs to places that are most valuable, you know. So I think about I think about Duke University, which is a, a Sakai adopting institution. Duke is a is a client of Longsight, so we we host for for Duke, and so. Duke ha hasn't needed to invest in, um, they haven't needed to invest in developers or infrastructure for, for Sakai in particular, or DB admins, uh, but instead they've really invested deeply in all sorts of consulting expertise for faculty. You know, so the, the ability to control where they're spending their money and spend it on stuff that is most strategic, I think is, is a hallmark of the, the one of the differences in cost between open source software and proprietary software. Great, thank you. Um, I know I've, I've heard it sometimes described as sort of decoupling um, the support from the software itself. So it does give you a lot more options for the support pieces that go along. Um, so in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to our second myth. Um, and that is, Open source software is of lesser quality than proprietary software and not enterprise grade. So Josh, this one actually goes to you. How would you respond to that? All right. Well, so I see two questions in here. The first question is, can open source software uh, be of high quality? Um, and can it support the needs of an enterprise? That's one question. Another question that is, uh, 
you know, buried in here is, is proprietary software also of high quality across the board, you know? So I think that from an open source perspective, you know, open source software can be of very high quality and can absolutely support the needs of an enterprise. You know, we, we look to some of the some of the open source technologies that underlie the Internet. So think about Linux, uh, which, uh, you know, feeds servers everywhere across the world. Uh, think about Python, which is a hugely popular development language um, and is really deeply enmeshed in the field of machine learning. Think about PHP, which powers uh, applications like Slack and Spotify and Moodle and lots of others, you know, so these are these are open source products that are of extremely high quality and are absolutely supporting enterprises around the world. I mean, you might also think about Firefox or LibreOffice. Um, and as we think about Aperio tools like Sakai and Xerti and Opencast and others, you know, these are these are likewise high quality products that are making a difference at institutions. And these institutions rely on these products. The second question that's built in here is, is proprietary software of high quality across the board? And absolutely, lots of it is. But I think also, you know, we've all experienced this. The ed tech landscape is really littered with proprietary software that didn't work all that well, uh, or maybe not as intended. I think many, many, many of us have experienced proprietary software that might be very good, but the support isn't great or the delivery or the implementation isn't great. You know, so I would I would argue that software quality, whether we're talking about open source software or proprietary software is really more a function of the planning that goes into the creation of that product, the expertise of the developers that are behind it, the expertise of the DevOps staff supporting hosting. Really, those are much, much close, much more closely tied to the quality and the enterprise caliber of the software than whether it's purely open source or proprietary. Great. And would any of our other folks like to add on to that, Therese? Yeah, Will, I would. I think another key thing just to layer on to what Josh said is transparency. Right. With open source software, you have the ability to go in and you can look at the code. You can look at how they've reacted to possible security um, items that have come up and they've handled it. It's documented. It's there for you to visibly see and to do what you want with. Um, when you go and you're with proprietary products, right, you're taking their word for all of this stuff. There's not much that's really transparent in your face visible right you have to take what they give you as word so i think that's a key thing to think about when you're looking about you know quality of proprietary versus open source right there's a lot of various things that you need to weigh but i think looking at open source and especially you know these projects with within a perio it's transparency that is key and you don't want to forget anybody else Move on to myth three, which is open source software requires extensive in-house technical expertise. This is the one we hear a lot from smaller organizations who maybe don't have a huge IT staff on site. Um, so they're always a little bit nervous about um, going open source. So Sharice, what would you tell those folks to give them a little more confidence? So I see this from several perspectives. One, if you're looking at open source, you want to research and you want to understand the community. So here today, we're focusing on the Aperio projects, right? The community behind these projects, they are motivated, they are talented. And the biggest thing is that they care, right? Get to know the projects, get to know the people. Again, as I mentioned previously, what they do is, is all visible, it's all accessible. Um, so that you can actually see what they do out there. So one thing, as far as um, having technical support in-house, you actually have avenues to get information that you need from the community. So not only are they hands on the keyboard, doing engineering, developing these great products, but you should see the amount of documentation that's available. If you need help with initial deployment, with configuration, with upgrades, with migrations, with troubleshooting, take a look at what these projects have actually created for the public. It's there for the taking if you go and just take a look at things. The other thing that the community offers are online like Slack chat channels. Um, several of them have Jira boards. 
Uh, many of them have like working groups and forums where you can actually participate to ask questions, to collaborate and to get some help. Again, that's kind of assisting, right? With that technical need that you might think you have to have on resident on site. Yes, yeah, some expertise would definitely be a good to understand what you're doing and what your needs are, but you have a community behind you, which I think is really critical and important to realize when you're looking at open source products. Now, the other thing is if you maybe you lost people, you don't have any technical expertise, or really you just want a little bit more peace of mind, that's where you can look at possibly supplementing and filling in those gaps with some vendor support. And some key things to look at when you're endeavoring in that opportunity is maybe look at what are really your support needs. Are you looking for a company that can give you a service level agreement, specific time that they're going to get back to you and fill those specific needs? Those companies are out there and they can help you, right? We can help you. Um, if you're looking for maybe a just to fill a gap or an ad hoc question or two, there's strategic staffing options that are available. And again, minimal cost depending upon your needs. But the big thing from a vendor support perspective is really just to give you peace of mind. We've got your back. We've got your covered. If you want that additional layer on top of an already great community that is there to provide you that technical support when you need it. What's, what's kind of neat, Therese, is the is the choice that institutions have when they go down the open source software route. I mean, that was that that's the heart of what I heard you just say is that, uh, you know, institutions that want to maintain extensive in-house technical expertise can and can have a whole lot of control that way. Institutions that want to outsource to a trusted vendor that technical expertise can and there are really good people out there and really good relationships that can help make that possible. And they can choose some middle ground if that's useful for them as well. So the, the, the aspect of choice that's built in is really nice. Yeah, I know from the Sakai world, we have some institutions that are heavily involved and do a lot of their own technical work. And there are others that really treat it as a commercial product almost. It's been hosted, they kind of outsource everything. So it really is a continuum, I think. Um, okay, so let's move on to our fourth myth. I do want to leave a little time for questions from the audience. So um, our fourth myth is open source software provides less security for student data than proprietary. So Miguel, you want to address that one? Yeah, right. I mean, this is a classic myth that was never demonstrated. So for me, it's not, not true. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, every every software in the world incorporates open source technologies or runs using open source technology. I mean, it's everywhere. It's present in, in data centers, it's in the consumer devices, in the, it's in the applications. And in the case of the learning technologies, I think all of them, maybe no exceptions, maybe, run or rely or have open source software. So it's very present since the first user interaction since the first student interaction until the last bit is stored in the databases. So it's it's present in, in every single interaction. So after all, uh, the open source if, is widely adopted because of the of, of its coll collaborative and public nature. So at the end, it's convenient for both developers and also the malicious actors. Um, so at the end, security, securing open source supply chains requires a combination of, of automated tooling, best practices, education, collaboration. And it's exactly with, with what, what we do with the software, with the open software we deliver. And I don't think there's a big difference with proprietary software. In, 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 I mean, in terms of security, how different is nowadays Android or iOS or Linux and Microsoft Office and LibreOffice I mean, maybe proprietary software is even more attacked than open source nowadays. So because in, in our open source communities, we take care of the security in our work, working groups. We create software using the best practices. We follow the recommendations. We have the help of the automated tools and we stay informed about the, la the latest happenings in the open source market. Um, and also we engage with other communities and experts. And one of our examples is our Aperio projects. Since 2004, I think, we haven't had a single student data breach that is inherent to the software in any institutions. And every single public vulnerability exposed in, in the internet was mitigated 
probably on the zero day. So when there's a CVE, when there's a, a, a threat, I think this open source community responds on in the first day. And another example is, is the US government. They transition a lot from proprietary software into open source software. And they consider open source as an option in their cybersecurity plans. So if it's a good alternative and it's enough secure for them, why is not secure for others like, like us? So after all, I think that proprietary software should focus on improving their products instead of attacking open source with this. Thoughts from some of our other panelists on the security issues? So I'm going to jump in again once more, and I feel like I'm repeating myself, but when it comes to security and open source, I think it's imperative to just say this. Um, when you compare that to proprietary software and security, again, it's the visibility that open source has, the lack of visibility that proprietary software does not have. Um, it's the open source teams, the community members that actually, like it was just mentioned, right? They look at what's going on as far as security out there. They make it visible to our community, the Aperio community, the users of the commu community. It's what we do with that information. And they resolve those items. You can research it. You can see the details. And again, you can even look down into what they did and how their recommendations are viable solutions for any security issue that does come up. So it's that full transparency when it comes to security, that's critical because with proprietary software, they just want you to believe them and trust them. And not that they're all bad, but I'm just saying you need to weigh the pros and cons. Yeah, there's a there's an ownership that happens when you're running open source that you really own your data. Um, you have a lot more control over it than you do when you have a commercial vendor. They own your data. We're going to open it up for questions from the audience. So I'll give you guys just a minute or two. Um, if you have a question you'd like to pose to any or all of our panelists, um, please go ahead and type it into the chat. Um, while you guys are thinking, I'm going to start off with a question that we uh, got in advance from Patrick um, about the procurement process. This is um, sometimes tricky. Um, how would procurement work in an institution that's interested in identifying and assessing all options for an enterprise solution, including open source. And this is sort of the typical RFP process that a lot of institutions go through. Anybody like to jump in on that one? Josh, you want to go? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I certainly can. I have to say that RFPs, I mean, I, I, I've only experienced them a bit from the institutional side, but certainly from the vendor side, they're a little on the painful side, you know, and, you know, from, from, from my, I'll just, I'll just say this, right, you know, so I don't have an answer to this question, but I do have an observation to make, which is that RFPs are incredibly time intensive. And, uh, you know, the, the information they gather doesn't seem to be all that conducive to providing the insights that institutions or adopters more generally need to figure out whether to adopt a product. Um, so I would just, uh, you know, encourage folks at, at adopting institutions who are here today to think about whether there might be other processes that perhaps are more insight intensive and less labor intensive than the traditional RFP process. Okay, I'm gonna jump in. So I have a few things. <laughs> So when you're actually looking for assistance, right, from vendors, there are several key things to really look for. Um, one is obvious the experience, but it's proven working knowledge of the experience, right? It's word of mouth. It's listening to the community. It's listening to your peers. Um, and it's those vendors that don't just provide support, but they actually su support for the, the products and the applications you want. But it's also those vendors that have working knowledge of higher education, right? They have feet on the ground, understanding of what those problem spaces are, what those issues are, what those gaps are, and can relate and therefore, therefore provide you that support that you need if it's development or troubleshooting or whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. But it's important that there's a combination of those things, right? It's the higher ed domain and it's the expertise, expertise and domain of those specific open source applications. Um, 
I, I think those are kind of the, the blatant obvious things that I would make sure that you're taking a look at. So Alan, how about you from the sort of institution perspective on, on this question? What's been your experience um, with that sort of treatment process? Well, you know, requests for proposals, you're going out, you're trying to find a product. You often have certain procurement requirements, right? Uh, I happen to be from a private institution, but I know that many state institutions have many, you know, mandated requirements that maybe are, you know, sometimes even outside of the control of the people asking for RFPs. Um, and then there are obvious things that you need to think about too, like accessibility and things like that, right? Um, for when, when I've gone through an RFP process, putting things out there, you know, I want to think about the general things like what does support look like? What is your commitment to, um, keeping uptime, even, you know, I'm not expecting hundred percent, but you know, what is the, um, what are the targets? What are the response times? You know, are there extra fees? Uh, when I work with a lot of commercial vendors, um, it does come down to a certain point where eventually there's like a you know, I hate to use the, the term nickel and diming, but where every little interaction, suddenly there was another price tag and another price tag. And, um, you know, that becomes rather, you know, challenging. It also makes you kind of not even want to engage, right? Um, on that side of things. So having that upfront, that transparency that Sharice definitely, you know, laid out there um, is helpful. Now, I understand from the vendor perspective that it's challenging too to complete you know, what, what is that giant list of forms? And, you know, there, sometimes the requirements are legal, uh, whether it's state by state, et cetera. Um, and they have to do it in order to meet whatever guidelines. Um, but I would push towards Josh's notion of like making an RFP related to what is the end goal of the product? What are your personal goals for using? What's your vision for having whatever the product is? You know, if it's a teaching and learning, what do you want to um, empower your community to be able to do? Uh, what are your big, big points? And then, you know, engaging a vendor in just open conversations about how do you meet these challenges? Um, but not necessarily need a 20 page essay from the vendor on how they meet their challenges, if that makes any sense, right? I, at the end of the day, I don't even know if anybody's, you know, reading every single line of that RFP response, you know, uh, hopefully they're not just weighing, like printing it out and weighing the weight of each one and going with whichever one's heavier right? Um, they're actually going through and having a dialogue. Um, and I can say in the open source community, I mean, just, you know, to be honest, in any, you know, I'm, I'm talking from the LMS perspective, you find open communities around any LMS, commercial or not, right? Uh, you can find discussion boards, etc. But I've certainly found that so many people within the open source community are very free with sharing the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly of, of what's going on, the areas and issues. But I found so much more engagement, so much more connection in those communities um, that I found really, really valuable. Um, and that, that's kind of like the intangible off to the RFP, right? You know, there's, there's the RFP of like a vendor trying to say, okay, your question A, here's my answer. Your question B, here's my answer. You really need to go to the individuals who are actually using the product. Um, and I think from my perspective, I found those communities, you know, from both JSIG and Sakai and, and Aperio, et cetera, um, very inviting, very, you know, open hearted. Um, and, and they'll tell you the honest, their own perspective that what they view is their honest truth. Right. Um, and, and I find that valuable. Um, but Josh, I, I, I don't know if you noticed in, you know, I saw you, you know, uh, replying to the comment a bit, but I do think, you know, maybe case studies or examples, especially from open source platforms that quote unquote won, you know, is there some way to open source something that doesn't expose anything that might be, um, you know, private to an institution, but they basically open source of why we selected this product and some of the open answers that, that are, you know, okay to share that might ease the burden on some vendors and also raise the awareness of, um, institutions, academic institutions, of why they might want to consider a platform. Um, so I, I think that's a genuine, I, I love that suggestion. So thank you, Didi. I just wanted to acknowledge that in the chat. 
Okay, we're actually getting a little close to our end of um, session time. I think we have 10 minutes to go. Um, are there any other questions that folks would like to ask in the time remaining? So, um, how about a few uh, concluding thoughts? So does anyone have sort of words of wisdom that we can uh, take with us uh, from this? I guess I'll just add in go. Wilma really quick. So I think one of the things that maybe innately we assumed and perhaps didn't say out loud was, you know, obviously do your homework, but when you're talking about open source, it's community across the board. So if you're looking at the people that are working in the community, if you're looking at the vendors who are providing support or assistance within the community, what kind of experience and involvement do they have, right? Because that involvement is really going to keep those people across the board aware of what's the here and the now? What are they hearing from higher education? What are the needs? How are they fulfilling those within those projects? Are the projects getting the participation they need? Maybe they need to get more people to join. Are those vendors really aware of the status of higher education, what the needs are, and coupled with those applications? So again, kind of something obvious when we're talking about you know the Aperio projects and what's available, but um, I just wanted to say it out loud. Just want to say thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate your insights today. Thank you.